Hallelujah, hallelujah. Welcome once again to Christ Disciples Institute Ghana <clears throat> as we conclude the session seven, Spiritual Leadership. Today we shall be taking SL705, which is the last segment of uh, this course, Spiritual Leadership. SL705 is ecclesiastical leadership. Ecclesiastical leadership. We're going to explain what that means as we proceed. Let's go straight to reading the background scripture and then we'll proceed to the lesson for today. 1 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 13. This is a faithful saying, if a man desire the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, least being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he falls into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, looking at the scripture we just uh, finished reading, a careful observation tells you the qualifications for church leadership. Now, let's go straight to understanding what ecclesiastical leadership means. Remember that our course has been spiritual leadership. And from our previous lessons, it is obvious that not all spiritual leaders are ecclesiastical leaders. We have talked about the fact that every believer is a leader. And by being influenced by the Holy Spirit, you are a spiritual leader of one sort or the other. But when it comes to ecclesiastical leadership, it is still the same believers who are already spiritual leaders, who are already under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that are now brought in to give leadership to the church. So ecclesiastical leadership is the kind of spiritual leadership that administers and manages the affairs of the church or a ministry organization. When I say ministry organization, I mean ministries that are not necessarily uh, of the congregational uh, type, but a ministry that is focused on one aspect or the other in Christian service. Now, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where I've just read now, it's anyone who aspires <clears throat> to be an overseer or bishop in the church desires a noble work. And so the ecclesiastical leadership we're talking about is about that noble work of being an overseer or a bishop. It is leadership in the church by appointment and ordination of the Holy Spirit through the church. It is where the Holy Spirit, you know, appoints people to take charge of the people of God, but doing that through the church. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he said, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock among whom which the Holy Spirit 
have not done what made you bishops or overseers. So you see that in as much as it was the church that physically ordained or consecrate or appoint a person to take that role as a as an overseer, it is the Holy Spirit that must have done that. Just like it was in the time of Paul, he says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I have called them. Hallelujah. They were to carry out some kind of you know, missionary work and then oversee churches in the Gentile world. So it is the church that Jesus Christ has purchased with his blood and has appointed these overseers or what we call the episcopos or bishops to handle their affairs, to take care of his flock, feed my flock, feed my sheep. Hallelujah. So ecclesiastical leaders are made overseers by the Holy Spirit to lead the people of God under divine inspiration and influence in church management. Now, these ecclesiastical leaders are supposed, like I said earlier, to be spiritual leaders. By right, if you are not a spiritual leader, you, can, you shouldn't be an ecclesiastical leader. So this is more of ecclesiastical spiritual leadership. Okay, so you have to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You are supposed to be governed by the Holy Spirit in carrying out your duty as a church leader. Now, ecclesiastical spiritual leadership, like I call it, is opposite of secular leadership. Secular leadership is the normal leadership you see in the society where anybody who is qualified by age, by social status, by educational qualification, or by years of experience and natural abilities is appointed. You can imagine the, what happened when Samuel wanted to go and anoint the king of Israel. And he came to the house of Jesse. When he saw the first son of Jesse, he was very elegant, you no know, huge, with six packs, <laughs> very bold. He said, ah, this one would be a good king. He quickly got up to go and anoint him. And God said, hey, keep your oil down. And then he looked at the second one and said, it must be this one. He watched and looked by physical appearance and physical abilities. These are how secular leaders are chosen. And then eventually, after the whole six of them passed through the hands of Samuel, none of them were approved by God. And God, through Samuel, asked the father to call in the last son, David. And when David came in, he said, Arise and anoint him. But David does not look like someone who should be anointed. But among the brothers of David, he was the only one that indeed was a spiritual leader. He had already had an encounter with God, an experience with God, even in the, in the wilderness or in the bush where he takes care of the sheep. He has been brought up by God. He has been under the influence of the Spirit of God. When he said, the Lord is my shepherd, none of his brothers could have said that. So, in secular leadership, you look at those physical qualities. But in spiritual leadership, God himself look at the qualities. In as much as uh, other qualities have been listed out that we just read in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. You can go back and carefully read the whole of that. So spiritual leadership, as in ecclesiastical leadership, has nothing to do with secular leadership. There, come, there could be one or two similarities in terms of what leadership is, but it is not the same thing as ecclesiastical spiritual leadership. Now, the question is, why should we have ecclesiastical leadership? After all, everybody is just a spiritual leader. All the children of God, you know, we are all filled with the Holy Spirit. We are doing one work or the other for the Lord outside anywhere we find ourselves. Is that not enough? Why should there be ecclesiastical leadership? In other words, why should there be church leadership or ministerial leadership as it were? Now, just as every organization needs leadership, the church as a spiritual organization also needs what? Leadership. And just as the future of any organization is connected to its leadership, similarly, the future effective management and growth of the church is tied to its leadership. Absence of leadership leads to chaos, disorder, confusion everywhere. The Bible says, where there is God is not the author, 
God is not the author of confusion. So leadership brings what? Order. When there is leadership, there is order. Things are put in their right perspective. Remember, we're talking about why ecclesiastical leadership. So ecclesiastical leadership is needed to bring both spiritual and administrative order in the church. Without spiritual leadership, there will be no spiritual and administrative order in the church. The Bible tells us, as we said earlier, Proverbs 29, 18, everyone will do as they please when there is no leadership. Say, where there is no vision, the people will perish. And that word perish means the word to do as they please. When you say, oh, believers are not doing any how they like. Christians are not doing any how they like. That any how they like, you see, is an indication of lack of leadership. Somebody may be there and say, I am the leader. But is he giving leadership? If he's in the church, he has to do it under the influence of the Holy Spirit if the church has to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, he said, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Where there is no leadership, everybody goes haywire. You know, if you read the book of Judges chapter 17, uh, even before 17, you see there was no king in Israel. After the time of the Judges, you begin to see that Israel was just like that. Everybody do as you like. And uh, that led to a lot of disaster, destruction. In fact, it led to the destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. That was almost wiped out because of the kind of crime and kinds of honor, all kinds of evil that became rampant among these same Israelites that were just brought out from the land of Egypt. That is the problem when there is no leadership. And so that is why God, in his wisdom, approved church leadership. When God elected, Jesus Christ elected 12 men to serve as his messengers for the establishment of the church, he was putting in place leaders because those apostles eventually became overseers of the early church. So when even when the early church started, they only had 12 apostles who were also the overseers or bishops of the church. Something happened. The population of the church multiplied. People were in their thousands. Twelve men could not have handled them. And so what happened? There was a little problem, and by the leadership of God, they had to appoint another set of leaders to attack to the overseers called the deacons. These ones are to help the overseers see to the running, smooth running and proper organization of the church. We see in Acts of Apostles, chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, they say, Now in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose what? Complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve apostles summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. So here the apostles were to take charge of the praying and the ministry segment of the ministry, while the deacons are to take care of the administrative business of the church. And, saying, and this saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochinus, Nicanor, Timon, Famas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed and laid hand on them, the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So you see, there was a need for the appointment of leaders who would take charge of the administration and the spiritual aspect of the church. Now, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, you see again Paul sending Titus to a place called Crete. What was he to do there? He was to also appoint bishops. He says, for in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, say, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking 
and appoint elders, i.e. bishops, in every city as I commanded you. So there were churches here and there, the churches and the houses, various houses. You know, in those days, it was house churches that they have. They don't have buildings where you call you no know, temple or whatever. They meet in homes. Now, there were so many homes in all the cities, and they needed to coordinate all these uh, home churches so that things can be done decently and in order. So Titus was sent to appoint a bishop to control each city. So each city, a bishop is appointed to take care of the other elders who are handling the home or house churches. Why? For the reason of orderliness. In Acts of Apostles chapter 14, verse 21 to 23, the Bible says, And when they had preached the gospel, so when they had done what? Appointed elders and bishops in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. See, when they have preached in those cities and churches, usually house churches, we are all established all over, they appointed elders. Now, under the bishopric uh, uh, office, you have various levels. You know, the people we call elders then are the people you call pastors or priests today. So they have the, the bishops who take charge of the cities, the elders or priests or pastors who take charge of their home or house churches, and then the deacons who assist them. So you see these three layers. The two segments are the bishopric segment, and the other layer is the uh, diaconite uh, uh, level, that is, those who serve as helpers, servants, deacons. All right? So Paul instructed them to have elders in each of the churches and have bishops that oversee each city. Having seen that, we have already looked at the qualification. They don't just appoint anybody to be because sincerely they are supposed to be spiritual leaders to become ecclesiastical leaders. So ecclesiastical leaders are supposed to be what? Spiritual leaders. And so it's not just anybody who just gets up that becomes. It is just this season when the church have gone out of control that you see all kinds of people taking titles and become, you know, bishops, uh, reverends, whatever title they call themselves, and bringing occultism into the church. And when these things are happening, when you watch most of these things on television, you ask yourself, is this the church? You see certain things happening and you wonder why. Because there is no spiritual ecclesiastical leadership. Even when you have things like CAN, Christian Association of Nigeria, or the Ghana Pentecostal Council, or the National Council of Charismatic Churches, all these councils are not giving leadership. They are just there as trade union to, to talk with the government. They do not really give leadership. And so you see things happening in a hair wire you know, style that makes the world look at the church and they shake their head and say, is this the church? When the church went into the dark age and came out of it and went into another season of dark age, which I think we are still in at this time, leadership is really, really lacking. What should these people be doing? When you have become an ecclesiastical leader, you have been ordained a pastor, you have been ordained a bishop, you have been ordained whatever leadership role, you have been ordained to do in the church. What should be your duties? Now, we'll read some scriptures here <coughs> and point out from these scriptures what their duties are. We, we don't look at the benefit aspect and forget the, 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 the duty aspect. It is the duty that makes it an office. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 30, he said, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers. To do what? To shepherd. To shepherd. Now, if you want to understand what shepherds do, look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. All these things the Lord does for you as shepherd is what you are supposed to do. So you are not just having a title, I'm pastor or I am deacon or I am whatever title they may give you in your denomination. It does not matter. What matters is to understand your duty. You are to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You are a steward. For I know. Why? Why should they uh, 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 shepherd? Because I know that after my departure, is not what we are having.
all kinds of people that have taken titles that have become pastors, leaders of churches, and bringing all kinds of that. There is no demarcation between the world and the church anymore. He said, Paul said that we have to have these leaders who will properly feed the church and take care of these people spiritually and managerially so that these wolves that will come in will not eat the flock. He said, they will not spare the flock. He said, also from among you, not only the wolves from outside that will come in, and try to destroy the church. He said that from among you yourself, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. A young man wrote something this uh, today, and he said that when evangelism went from come to Christ to come to our church, that is when he knew that things have things have fallen apart. When evangelists now oh, come to our church, our pastor is very powerful in the sea road. Our pastor can do this. He man is a strong man of God. He can pray. He can do this. Just come to our church instead of come to Jesus. Now, when the evangelists have shifted from come to Jesus to come to our church, it has become a problem. Remember those who go for evangelism, we don't talk about our church. We don't talk about Christ. But so, ah, which church are you coming from? That's not important. Just listen to the word of God. And, but I want to know your church. Leave church matter first. Let us hear the word of God. By the time we are finished sharing the word of God with the person, I will tell him, take this trans read, and if you have any issue, come. He said, please, but I want to know your church. It's okay. Behind the trans you have there, you have our church there. If you will, like, you can come. If you have any question, you can come around. You know. So we don't emphasize on our church. If the person will discover that he attends a church that we consider a living church, we encourage that person, go back to your church, Tell your pastor you just gave your life to Jesus Christ. You were not born again before, but now you are born again. So go to that church and if possible, can we have the phone number of your pastor so that we can contact with him and see how you are growing. And that is how evangelism was done then. But today, that is not it. Why? He said, from among yourself, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away what? Disciples after themselves, not after the Lord. Another duty clearly spec, uh, uh, shown in the scripture can be seen in James chapter 5, 14 to 15. Please note that the previous one we say is oversee them, shepherd them, protect them. So the, the, the shepherd or the bishop or the deacon and the and the elders, as you, whatever title may be given them in the present day church, your duty is to feed the flock, that is shepherd them. Your duty is to protect them from what? Salvage wolves. Both those who are coming from outside and those who will grow up from within. You know, when men slept, the enemy does what? Plant. So all these things are there. So that is number one duty. Let's look at James and see if we can find another duty that the elders or bishops or deacons should be doing in the church. In James chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, he said, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the what? The elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. So one of the duties of the bishops and the deacons or the elders of the church or the ecclesiastical leader, as per our topic today, is to administer healing to the sick. Is there anyone sick among you? That person should be prayed for, and then if he has sinned, the church will forgive him. Why will the church forgive him? He said, whoever you forgive has been forgiven. Jesus Christ has already forgiven. You are to administer that forgiveness. So most sicknesses are tied to one sin or the other. So when that sin is forgiven, that sickness has no place to stay. The same way, so the duties of the ecclesiastical leader is to administer healing to the sick members of the church. The next duty we can find in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. So let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the world. And so one of the duties of the ecclesiastical leader here is to labor in the world. Hallelujah. To labor in the world. Someone who teaches the word to the benefit and growth of the flock. The next one is Titus 
chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. In Titus chapter 1, from verse 9 to 11, it says, The elders must hold fast the faithful word, as he has been taught, and that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, for there are many insubordinate, both idol talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching things which they ought not to for the sake of dishonest gain. Hallelujah. Teaching what they ought not to for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, if you look at this scripture, you can point out what the duty of the ecclesiastical leader should be. Number one, he should be sound in doctrine and using the conviction that is from the word of God to convict people and to bring many who are insubordinate and idle talkers who work is to work to deceive the brethren and then subvert teaching things just for financial gain, material gain, dishonest gain. So why must they work? Why must they lead? They must stop those people from continuing with those false teachings. Most times when we talk against false teaching, people say, oh, well, mind your business, mind your business. Yes, I will mind my business as long as that thing you are teaching does not affect my flock. <laughs> because one of my duties as a leader is to protect the ones who God has placed under my shepherd rod. So if I see that your teaching is going to destroy them, I must, I, I, I have been commanded to stop you from doing that. And how do I stop you to fight? You know, I will teach the truth and make it open so that those uh, members of the flock, whether students or church members or whatever it may be, they will know the truth. When they know the right thing, they will not be deceived outside. We are in the season of great deception. And the Bible says there will be great falling away. In our previous course on Ecclesiastes, um, eschatology, we talked about the great falling away. If we do not do this work, the falling away will be so great. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 17 will show us again the duties of the ecclesiastical leader. Remember the elders who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith you must follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they do what? They watch out for your souls as those who must give account. They watch out for your souls as those who must give account. While shepherds watch their flocks by night. There are night seasons in the life of people. The shepherd, the ecclesiastical leader now, has been given the mandate to watch over spiritual leadership. We have studied spiritual leadership has it had to do with having influence in the spiritual realm. Most times, God has to reveal most of these things to you as a leader. You have to pray. You have to counsel. You have to watch over them to ensure that they do not fall from their faith. He said, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that will not profit you. So we see from all here, and when you get the material, you look at them very well, and you see that we have pointed out several duties of the ecclesiastical leader. Now let's look at who should be an ecclesiastical leader. Is it everybody? Ecclesiastical leadership is for believers, like I said, who are under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and appointed by the church under the divine direction. Or they have a direct call from God to carry out a mandate. So if you are not a, a, a spiritual leader already, you are not qualified to be an ecclesiastical leader. Now, if you read uh, First Timothy chapter 3, where we read, he said, they must not be a novice. You don't just get born again today, and the next morning you want to be a pastor. You want to be a... No, 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 no. You have to pass through a process. The Bible says they must be what? Tested. They must be tested. You must pass through a process. You grow in rank. That is why in most church organizations, you pass through levels. You start by being a normal church member, and then you grow into becoming a team member, a team leader, 
and the unit leader, and then gradually, 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 before you can become a whole church leader, starting with an associate or assistant pastor, before you become a pastor. So you don't just come today and say, wake up one morning and say, God has called me, I want to become a, 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 a pastor. The next day you open church, and all you know is to look at what you hear on television and radio, and then you, you join, you join. You are going to lead men, I say, because you know nothing. I've seen many people who are juju priests, Suddenly, they are now general overseers, people who have not known anything. Uh, after all, it's not Bible. It's not Bible. The Bible may look simple to you. You say, after all, it's not, I can read it. You can read it, but do you know what is in it? That is why when the Bible was first produced, it was under lock and key. Only the priests who have been taught on how to explain were allowed to open it. It was when the Reformation came that that lock and key was removed and people were allowed. And in fact, that was even when the thing that we are trying to stop became worse. All right, let us understand again that there are two categories of leadership in the church. I'm not talking about ministry in terms of general ministry. I'm talking about leadership, ecclesiastical leadership. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, Paul writing said, Greetings from Paul and Timothy, bound servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Jesus, in Jesus Christ who are in Philippi, with the what? The bishops and the deacons. He didn't say apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. He said the bishops and the deacons. The bishops and the deacons can be apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist. These are uh, those words are gifts, like we discussed in our course in pneumatology. So these are the two key offices. So note that the leadership in the church are two main offices: the overseers and the servants. The overseers are the bishop and the servants are the deacons. When you say servants, you mean those who minister, those who take care of administrative work under the leadership of their uh, bishops or overseers or elders, as we call them. All church leaders are either bishops by levels, like I've explained, or deacons. Now, I've also shown us their qualification in the text where we read. But you can see more qualification in Titus chapter 1. 5 to 16 and verse 20 to 28. Sorry, chapter 20, verse 28 of uh, as of the Apostles. Now, these are the areas that shows us their qualification. If you do not have this qualification, wait until you have them. Do not just jump into it. It will not profit you anything. So, any qualified believer can aspire to be a bishop or a deacon. When I say bishop, I mean both the main bishops, the pastors, the associate pastors, the, the leaders, and as far as you are having any congregational leadership, ecclesiastical leadership, that's church leadership, then you fall into the category. Then those who are working as departmental heads, or shares, and other things, fall under the category of the servants, or deacons. When I say servants, I don't mean slaves, okay? Even though you are a slave of Jesus Christ, as it will. Now, whoever is qualified is free to say, Pastor, I feel God is calling me to be a pastor. God is calling me to be a church leader. All right, let us check. You have chosen a good thing, you desire well, but we'll not just take you in like that. We'll pass you through a process, we'll test you, we'll confirm, and if we are sure, then we will ordain you. So, the bishops and the deacons include all church or ministry workers, church departmental leaders, congregational pastors, field ministers, founders of ministries, or any associate leader, or those appointed by the church as head pastors or associates in an established church congregation or ministry, team leaders, all these people are supposed to be spiritual leaders, whether they are doing their work full-time or part-time, all right? All right, so let us proceed to say clearly that we must note that most times it is not everybody who have been ordained into the ecclesiastical leadership that are actually spiritual leaders. We can see it with our eyes in our world today. They are mainly, most of them are more like government workers. Most of them, most of them are just like secular leaders who are just carrying out mere administrative duties. There is nothing in them that is influencing anyone for Christ. They are not carrying out any of those duties we just mentioned earlier on. So 
This kind of secular and ecclesiastical leaders cannot be addressed as spiritual leaders. So in as much as we have spiritual ecclesiastical leaders, we have some people who are in the ecclesiastical leadership who actually are not spiritual leaders because some of them are not even born again. But they are pastors. There are pastors who are not born again. There are deacons who are not born again. There are bishops who are not born again. They have just joined the church, you know, and grow in rank and then fulfill all the requirements of the church, not even the spiritual requirements. They are not spiritual leaders, but they have been made deacons. They have been made pastors. They have been made associate pastors. And what do you think they will do? If they are even too nice, they will concentrate mainly on what? Administrative duties. But if not, you see them carrying out all kinds of evil. That is why we can't, we can't consider those ones spiritual leaders. So do not be carried away when somebody is an ecclesiastical leader. He is not automatically a spiritual leader. So we must note that being an ecclesiastical leader, a spiritual one at that, is a calling and not just an occupation or a company employment. Okay? It's a calling from God. Say, no one take this honor upon himself except he is called by God. Only when we understand leadership in the light of God's calling on our life will we lead effectively to his glory. <clears throat> According to the scriptures, God is not necessarily looking for those who will lord over people. No, he is looking for servant leaders. You know? Leaders who will humble themselves and do the work of the Lord as led by their chief shepherd and chief bishop, Jesus Christ. Now, the scriptures out there, you can read them. John chapter 12, verse 26, Isaiah 59, 16, Ezekiel 22, verse 30. Now, when God finds a man who is willing to be molded into a servant leader, then the possibilities of what he can do are limitless. He cannot just be limited because God will use him to maximum. People are looking for someone that will lead them into God's purpose and God's way. Not secular leaders that are just occupying position in the church. They need church leaders who truly believe God will do what he says he will do. People will follow church leaders who are indeed spiritual leaders. Who are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and understands the agenda of God. And who knows when to move into the dimensions of the Spirit as led by the Holy Spirit. So, with that understanding, you know who should be and uh, uh, how someone should be an ecclesiastical leader. All right, having said that, let's all quickly look into qualities. What qualities can we find in someone, apart from the one we have seen in the scriptures, that can make someone qualified indeed to be a spiritual leader? Sometimes when we discover these things, we as a church can even call you and say, bro, come we will ordain you into this office so that you can do more. We are ordaining you to do more, giving you more rights and privileges so I can go beyond the limit where you are. See, Joseph showed some qualities that made Pharaoh to make him the prime minister. So sometimes you see a pastor can call you out in the congregation and say, bro, I think the Lord will want you to serve in the church as a pastor. So, oh, sir, sir, no, 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 we're not putting you straight. You will serve an as an associate. We will guide you through. And uh, if at the end of the day you are not interested, no problem. But we see the qualities of uh, a spiritual ecclesiastical leader in you. And what are those qualities? Number one, they move people from where they are to where God wants them to be through their ministry, through their spiritual leadership as individual believers. They are enabling people to move from where they are spiritually, mainly to where God wants them to be. Number two, they depend so much on the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. They depend so much on the Holy Spirit. Then, number three, they are accountable to God. They are accountable to God. They know that whatever they are doing, they will give account. Just as a teacher has to has you know how to teach the students, and after we there will be an exam. That is how at the end of the journey you have to give account of your work. Do they know that we are stewards that will give account one day? So they are careful in how they carry out their leadership role. They are not influenced by people, they influence people through Christ. Number four, 
they influence all people. They try to reach out. Spiritual leaders can influence all people, not just God's people. God's agenda applies both in the marketplace and in the meeting place. Although spiritual leaders will generally move God's people to achieve God's purposes, God uses them also to influence the unbelievers. There are many unbelievers you know, who look at and say, Oh, in as much as I, I, I am not a Christian, I am I, I really what you are doing is really impacting my life. Remember when a, one of the governors told Paul, he said, in, in a short time, you are almost trying to make me what? A Christian. And uh, Paul said, not only you, but everyone that is hearing me. Hallelujah. So you don't only influence your congregation. Your duty as a ecclesiastical leader is not just for those within your congregation, but it has to reach out to even the unbelievers who have not believed in Christ. There are many people who belong to one religion or the other, because they don't really know what is in Christ. To them, Christianity is what they see around, what they have been watching around. They say, oh, that is Christianity. There's no difference between that and our religion. In our religion, we do like this. In your religion, we do like this. But by the time they get to know you personally and remove the, 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 the helmet of religion, the blindfold of religion, and look with their heart open, they begin to, ah, 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 what is this? Are you reading a different Bible from the other ones? What is I'm seeing something different from you. Are there two kinds of Christians? One of my friends will say there are three kinds of Christians. We have the Christians, the Christians, and the Christians. <laughs> I ask you, ask you, which one are you? Christian, Christian, and Christian. Which one are you? <laughs> so you don't only influence your everybody will want to accept Christ, but at least it will moderate the way things are being done, and at least we can live in a peaceful society. Number five, they work from God's agenda. They don't decide things for themselves. Jesus Christ said, of my important, we must take note of. We must also honor them. When you see people called reverend somebody, that word reverend is just a word of what? Honor and respect for the one who, is, who has given himself to ecclesiastical leadership. You must honor them. You must respect them. Now, whether you are a bishop, whether you are whatever title, that word reverend is what is used for all ecclesiastical leaders, especially those of them who are congregational heads. So every believer that is called in one capacity or another, we are all priests of God, we are all believers, everybody is a child of God, everybody is a priest, we are all royal priesthood, nobody is there, nobody is that, but... There are those that God has specifically ordained as a ecclesiastical leaders. In as much as you can be a spiritual leader as an ordinary church member, as it we are, or just a Christian that does one thing or that, there are those who call the first among equals. These must be given honor. They must be reverenced, they must be respected, and they must be enabled to do their work joyfully. How do you do that? Number one. You must be submissive and obey them. <clears throat> in Hebrew chapter 13, verse 7, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch over your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that will not be profitable to you. So, when you have a good ecclesiastical leader who is carrying out his duties as a minister of the gospel, don't frustrate his work, don't be rebellious. When he gives instruction, you do the opposite. Don't attack him. Don't try to frustrate his life because that will make him to grieve. And when he grieves, it will not be for your own good. It will not be for your own good. I'm not the one saying it. The scripture says, say, let them do it so that they can do their work with joy and not with grief. Many pastors are laboring with grief. The church members are really, really, really piercing their soul. Don't do that. Be submissive. And obey them, especially those of them who are ecclesiastical spiritual leaders, not just the ordinary ones who are not leading you in the path of Christ. You know your leaders. You know who they are. Respect them. Honor them. Now, even if they have made mistake, you, it, it does not give you the right to what to to become uh, uh, rebellious and fight in them and try to break up the church. If you do that, you are already creating trouble for yourself. Look at what happened to Korah, Dodan, and Abiram. The air swallowed them up. You cannot be physical air swallowing you up in the present time, but the things you eventually find yourself in eventually will be very, very terrible. So you don't do that because it will not profit you. Number two, 
follow their good examples. When a pastor who is trying his best and doing his work see you also learning and becoming more like what he's doing, he's happy. You know, he's happy. He has that joy. When even as a, a natural father, when you see your son growing up and uh, you know learning from you, and you're a good father, showing him good example, and your son is feeling you're, you're happy. But if a child is not following the examples of the father correctly, the father doesn't feel happy. So follow their good examples. Hebrew 13 7 says, Remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith you should follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. You already consider their conduct, you have watched the way they do their things, you have watched the way they live their lives, and do what you follow suit. Hallelujah. Number three, give them due financial support. Honorably, when you are blessed by a man of God, make sure, when I say man of God, I mean ecclesiastical leaders, make sure that you give them due material or financial support. They are entitled to it. It's not a privilege. It's an entitlement. And then you must do that honorably. If you are giving something to a man of God or, a, or, or, or to, to a, a, a minister of the gospel, you don't just pack something in your hand and, uh, and fold it and say, Pastor, take this now. Pastor, Pastor. Pastor, Pastor. Can you do that to a governor? You must package it in an envelope, make it look nice, and give it honorably. No matter how small it is, make it honorable. The, 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 the honor you give to it is what pleases the man, not even the content of your envelope. So make sure that whatever offering you are giving, don't do as if you are the Lord and Master of the church. No, you are not anything. In fact, when you are removed, the, everything will still go on well because you are insignificant. It is God who is making you what? Significant. So Galatians 6 says, 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18, and 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Let's read it. It said, the ones who have taught you the message, you must share all good things with them. You cannot be listening to the teachings. You are being blessed. Oh, Pastor, God bless you. I am so blessed by your teaching. In fact, so <laughs> thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Package something and bless him. He has washed you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, if someone has taught you the message, you must share every good thing you get with him. He said, let those who are taught the message share all good things with their teacher. The next passage says, let the elders who rule well be counted of what? Worthy of double respect, especially those of them who labor in the word and in teaching. They are studying daily, searching the scriptures, getting insight. Whether you are hearing them teach you, whether it's on Facebook, it's on.